Welcome to Solomon's Temple. I am Uncle Solomon. It's so great to have you here. And uh, please make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Don't forget to do that. I'm bringing you an exclusive interview with a pastor. Over the years, we've seen so many different pastors, prophets, apostles, making mistakes. And out of the ashes of those mistakes, they rise up again. And the beauty of it all is to be able to come out and say, hey, this is what happened. Especially when there is a third party, external party involved. And importantly, we've also seen over the years a lot of slay queens invading and masquerading as prophetess within the church and taking advantage of pastors or prophets. And we are going to be looking around all of that how did we get here how can young women beautiful talented gifted by god begin to indulge themselves in immorality with pastors how is that helping the church and how is that helping families within our community so i have with me pastor enoch piri Pastor, founder of Restoration House, I believe. Mm -hmm. He's been in ministry for quite a while now, but I will let him tell us a little bit more about himself. Thank you so much for joining me, Pastor. Thank you very much for having me, Solomon. It is important that we go back and try to understand you a little bit because mm. of the audience, obviously. Some people are familiar with you, some are not, mm -hmm. locally and internationally. Uh, but obviously, you've been on a lot of TV stations, TBN and all that, and, and you're well known. Tell us about your calling. When did you even sense, you know, the call to become a pastor, your relationship with God, that is? Wow. You know, I was uh, born in the Dutch Reformed Church, and uh, my parents were staunch believers of the, of the Reformed Church. And uh, as I was growing up, I got to know the Lord Jesus Christ mm. outside the Reformed Church. It was a time when uh, the likes of uh, Renard Bonke were coming to Africa. And uh, those days, the gospel of Jesus was preached everywhere. And uh, I made a commitment to follow Jesus because I was afraid of going to hell. Mm. That was the first and uh, most important reason why I gave my life over to Jesus because I was so certain that the world would end any moment from then. Mm. You know, and uh, after that commitment to Jesus, Uncle Solomon, uh, then uh, I started reading a lot of books. One of the books that I came across was the book written by Ellen G. White uh, called the, Gr the Great Controversy. The other book I read was... Um, about uh, the desires of ages. I, wrote th I read these books at the same time almost. And uh, they actually changed my perception of uh, my life mm. as well as how I looked at uh, eschatology or the future and how I looked at the church. So I had a burning desire then of uh, one day to become a priest. And I remember speaking to my father, asked my daddy that, look, I want to become a pastor one of these uh, good days, especially when I finished my grade 12 or my metric. And my father said to me, do you want to be a professional beggar? Because pastors are professional beggars. But now, what my father never understood then, there was a deep cry within me that was uh, pushing me to become a servant of the people especially when I looked at uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, the right. way he contributed to humanity and mm -hmm. society, as well as uh, how uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu contributed to humanity and uh, society. And people that inspired, inspired especially where ministry was concerned, it's not the so-called uh, charismatics of today. In fact, in those days when I spoke about going into ministry, ministry... Uncle Solomon was not as lucrative as it is today. Yeah. We saw pastors who walked long distances to get to their parishes and to get to see the people that were serving them in the church. And my motivation beyond that was to save 
humanity before I was introduced to the so-called apostolic and uh, prophetic, prophetic, which yeah. came at the right time, of course. So, so basically, that's my background. Mm, mm. And for you, it was the lesson that you you mentioned the fact that you know you saw pastors who would go a distance, who Absolutely. never really. It was never really a case of what I'm gonna get out of it. Absolutely, but it was, but it was more about God is asking me to give of my life. Indeed. To the gospel, to people. Indeed. How did that shape if, 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 In fact, before I even uh, go, uh, answer your second question, you, you know, two personalities came to me. In fact, three personalities came to me because I, I was so much eager to understand the, the nature of this gospel. So mm. I, I read a lot about David Livingstone about Robert Moffat. These are missionaries from Scotland. Yeah. Then I read about... And they did quite a lot in Zambia. Ab nation, absolutely, indeed. Yeah. I read about William Carey. And I also read about Hudson Taylor. At one moment, Hudson Taylor, when a poor old woman came to her house to borrow uh, three cents or pennies mm. to take her child to the doctor, uh, Hudson Taylor went inside the house and, uh, and knelt before the Lord and said, Lord, the Bible says, he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. Please don't let this loan take long. Amen. <laughs> then he went out and uh, gave this uh, poor lady uh, uh, some, some pennies. And these are people that actually motivated me and the impact that they made in these countries. And I felt like, you know what, one day I want to be a missionary and I want to transform the lives of the people and uh, touch millions of the people mm. by the means of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Mm. And how did that shape you uh, when you became a pastor? How did that shape your perception about sacrifices that you have to make? Because one thing we see today is, unfortunately, a lot of charismatic evangelical pastors are not ready to make those sort of sacrifices that you had seen from people like William Carey, you mm. know, uh, Hudson Taylor and mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're losing that part of the identity of the church, church leadership. How did that shape you and how did that prepare you also to go into ministry? First and foremost, uh, 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 Uncle Solomon, the concept of the so-called Azusa revival has been highly misinterpreted yeah. by the church, especially the, the evangelicals, the charismatics, the Pentecostals. It, it was a, a, a revival that I believe was meant to bring the giftings in the body of Christ, charisma in the mm. body of Christ. But to a certain extent, after the Azusa movement, there was a, a high level of commercialization of the gospel. And how did... Uh, uh, the, 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 the experience of um, Martin Luther, William Carey, David Livingston, uh, Mo Mo uh, Robert Moffat, uh, and, and others shaped my, 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 my pastoral is uh, to an extent whereby I felt that I can balance the two. Yeah. I can bring in the Reformation. I can bring in the Protestantism and uh, the, 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 the Charismatics together. Mm by also bearing in mind what a German philosopher once said, Karl Marx, you know, he spoke very painful words against the religious order of the day in Germany, where he said religion is an opium of the masses. Of the masses. And for many years, that kept on knocking at my chest to say, am I part of this machinery, a system mm. that propagates exploitation in the name of religion mm. now now mind you i'm a, I'm a very deep uh, decolonist if i can call myself i've never seen such a word in english <laughs> i consider myself as a as, as a as a a machinery of decolonization and i felt so many times in many years for for many years uh, conflicted how can i speak about decolonization yet i believe in jesus yep. whom is believed that uh, 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 the, the missionaries brought yes. Jesus yeah. to Africa in order to colonize our people. So, so for many years, I've tried by all means to balance both my theology as well as my charisma mm. in order to propagate and influence the people by the means of the same gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. Mm. Now, then there was the whole startup 
or planned, church planned for Restoration House. Yes. Tell us about the the beginning wow. and what the mandate was for Restoration House Church as a ministry, you being the leader. Beautiful. You know, I I I I, I stayed in Cape Town. I think for off the record, let me mention this. Yeah. I stayed in Cape Town and uh, I was approached by uh, Father Michael Epsley. Father Michael Epsley, at one time, those who follow history, he was, uh, he was uh, given a parcel bomb which blew both of his hands in Zimbabwe. Yes, yes. In I Zimbabwe. remember that story. Yeah. Yeah. So Father Michael Epsley uh, uh, moved to South Africa during the truth and reconciliation process uh, Father Michael Lepsley and Bishop Desmond Tutu, may he so rest in peace, they continued to propagate reconciliation in South Africa. And uh, after a while, Father Michael Lepsley approached me to say, you know what, only 20,000 people attended the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm. Therefore, there is a need for a parallel program to be initiated. And he called it uh, the Institute for the Healing of Memories then I became a participant of the Institute for the Healing of Memories. We went for training, and uh, we, were, we were debriefing mainly the ex-combatants, such as uh, those from the MK uh, and the APLA mainly, and also other members of our society. Then after I worked with Father Michael Epsley for a while, God ordained outside the, the structure, of course, by Bishop, um, uh, by Bishop Botwana in Soweto, that was in the uh, mid-90s, I felt led by the Spirit that uh, I need to do a ministry mm. or a church which is not going to be so much to the left and also not so much to the right. And then I called it restoration. It was about restoring order back to, to, to the original purpose of God. Actually, this is our tagline, restoring lives according to original purpose of God. And mm. uh, since then, I've been propagating the message of the kingdom, trying to decolonize our people from religion as well. Right. Because, because you see, most people, even in the church, they think colonialism is the worst that happened to Africa. Yeah. Religion even. Religion is actually a worst form of being colonized. Then, uh, then so Restoration House has been uh, that kind of uh, a vehicle that uh, I used in, the, in our community in Soweto, to be more precise, to engage people about uh, what is restoration. Restoration mm. is not about uh, coming to Jesus with your money so that you can exchange it with your healing. That's yeah. not what it's about. The, the nature of the gospel of Jesus is restoration. Mm. So, so, so the message of restoration, Uncle Solomon, came from my spirit, first and foremost, as an agenda of decolonizing the people and also bring back the original order in the body of Christ. Wonderful. Now, <laughs> when you talk about restoration, one of the things that uh, I have to ask you yeah. is the fact that you had a wonderful family. Yeah. And then, boom, you experience divorce. Yeah. And that in itself brings brokenness. Absolutely. In your life. Yes. Sir. In the life of your wife. Yeah. And children. And in the life of your children. Mm. Mm. Now there needs to be, for somebody who advocates restoration, obviously that would be very a setback. Absolutely. Big time. You know. Tell me about just your family generally. Yeah. Uh, you, you and your ex-wife were married for? 19 years. 19 years. Yeah. Uh, you believe in family. Absolutely, I do. Uh, but obviously, d divorce happened. Uh, tell me about that and just how that affected you, somebody who is an advocacy for restoration. How did that affect you, affect you mentally, spiritually, and otherwise? And also your family, your children. Uncle Solomon, to start with, divorce is an embarrassment. <laughs> mm. that, that's number one. Divorce is an embarrassment. Number two, divorce is an accident. Uh, 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 I don't know. 
to others. But this is my 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 definition, and this is not an, an academic definition. Yes, it is an accident in the sense that nobody gets married to divorce someday. Yeah. And uh, thirdly, and this is the, a very controversial statement that I might make to those that are religious fanatics. Not even God has solution for divorce. That's why the Bible says, I, the Lord, hate divorce. Hmm. Full stop. There's no further engagement that right. God is giving us about divorce. Divorce happened. And uh, behind the backdrop of this uh, divorce, to be honest with you, uh, 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 Uncle Solomon, uh, I messed up. Yes, I, I would love for you to take responsibility. Yes. Right? Yes. Because this is like... Uh, this Absolutely. is like we need to be straightforward and Absolutely. honest. Absolutely, I messed up, and I've always uh, said this uh, publicly and also privately to people that I know, in the sense that uh, you know when uh, the agenda of restoration and proclamation of the kingdom of God was uh, laid upon my spirit and my heart. Number one, I focus so much on the side of ministry because. I got so many invitations all mm. over the world. Mm. And uh, I got so many invitations locally in South Africa, uh, ch in churches, as well as uh, in um, uh, organizations. Mm. And uh, because of that, I guess I became too busy for my family. Right. You, you know, the order of loving God first, then family and church was somehow distorted. I put ministry I don't know where God was. Mm. I put ministry. God was there, but family was the least. And for so many years, my wife then was crying out for attention. Mm. And I felt like uh, she was kind of hindering me from fulfilling this uh, mandate. You know, uh, I felt like she was tying my hands, uh, tying my feet, and I can't run faster. Now, remember this point of time. Man is coming in, not not from ministry, by the way. Yes. Man is coming in from business. Part of you, you're a businessman. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So money is coming in. And uh, for me, I felt it was okay. If she nags too much, I give her 20,000 and said, go relax. Mm. Book yourself and the kids at the hotel and I'll be back. You know, so, so not to realize that actually in the process, I was actually breaking my family because remember this time around, I'm exposed to celebrities, female celebrities, you know, like uh, you go for these awards, you go for these uh, functions, mm. and uh, she sees me on TV, you come back home, and you feel like, look, I've just fulfilled my days, mm. my daily duties, and you come back home and she's nagging about it, who was that, and, mm. and you always want to be defensive. Mm. And the moment, the day when she said, I need a divorce, I thought, look, we can sit down and talk, mm. but it was too late. Mm. You know, because a very wise person told me that uh, uh, when a woman asks you for a divorce, it means she's gone through this all over again yes. in her mind. Mm. And by that moment when she is saying to you, it is done, mm. it is really done. Mm. So by then, that's when I was trying to look for mechanisms of um, distinguishing the fire. I remember when going to Bishop Katide, for counseling, yeah. and uh, it couldn't help. Went for I installed her pastor in Davidton. It couldn't help, but by then I think she had already given up to mm. the marriage, and uh, and uh, perhaps I'll do the same. But where you, where are you making changes then yourself, or it was just the same thing? You, you see, you see, I, I think at that time I had already overcommitted myself you are to used so many. To that yes, sort of like yeah. that 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 pattern. That lifestyle was embedded in me. It so was, you didn't like, I need to shut down. Yeah. You know, because also, also from my side, and I, I don't want to sound as though I'm justifying myself. There was this fear of losing an income because I've seen what poverty does. Yeah. Poverty is one of the things that I hate with all my life. Yeah. So I, I've got this fear of going back or sliding back into poverty. Mm. And I've also got uh, this fear of losing my family. So like I'm in the middle. So like I would make promises such as, look, when I come back from the US, when I come back from the US, the next trip to the UK, I'm coming with you. Yeah. So here I am, I come back from so, the US. So, so most of these trips you take, you go on solo trips. You don't go with her. Most of these events that you go with some of the celebrities, you most times you are alone. 
isn't okay. it? There were certain events. For example, let me start from overseas trips. Uh, on overseas trips, we agreed. I traveled alone. Then once a year, I went with her to UK because that's where our base was. Yeah. Once a year, I went with her to the United States. And once a year, we did Asia. So in a year, I think I traveled four times with her overseas. And, uh, and uh, because we opened a business back home in South mm -hmm. Africa uh, property uh, where she was running, we had about uh, then maybe eight, nine shops, mm -hmm. which she, she was running. So, and also the, 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 one of the reasons why I even encouraged her to leave job or to leave work was for her to focus on the children than the, having nannies looking after yeah. our children. Yeah. So, you have to parent your absolutely. kids yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so basically it was a situation whereby uh, she's got to, uh, some work to do at home. Hmm. So four times in a year, I tried. Min it's, it's a maximum four times in a year. Maybe it would be, it would, it would be maybe twice or three times hmm. a year we hmm. travel together overseas. Hmm. Now, hmm. locally, some of these uh, events would be where you are invited to be a, an MC or a, a speaker. But okay. uh, in situations whereby I was maybe presenting an award, I made sure that I come with her because, you know, and now this is like once or twice in a year. Mm. So you take so many trips, right? And you go to so many places alone. Yes, sir. You are a, a gifted man. You're handsome, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you're a businessman by the side. Yes. You know, did you ever cheat on your wife? That's the question. That's the godly question. Yes, I did. You did. Yes. And it became a problem or she wasn't aware of it. She became aware of it. She became aware of it. And I think it took a very long time for her to let go and uh, forgive. I think this where mistrust. That's right. You know, I'm, because I ask you that question, not just for you, but there's so many people who are going to be watching your, your <laughs> yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. And also your honesty in without hesitating. When I ask you this question, you didn't hesitate. <laughs> okay, yeah. You answered straight up. Yes, I did. For a lot of leaders, especially, they would hesitate. They would not probably not tell me the truth because I don't know. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know. And how did that affect her huh, and how did that affect you in creating that brokenness that the restoration was never really achieved yeah you know uh uncle solomon that that was hard uh, in the sense that um uh, um it's like tears come into your eyes absolutely <laughs> you know it's like uh, when i have to go to cape town hmm. she doesn't trust me that i'm alone in the room I get you. Now, 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 you must remember some of the meetings that I would have. I would be meeting highly profiled politicians, mm. and she would say, "Nkalevid, unfunukbon, whom are you sitting with?" You know what I mean. Yes. So I, I won't compromise the people that I'm meeting by making a video. And uh, now, see, these politicians. My meeting, of course, is based on uh, a certain maybe agenda or business, then I can't take a video and say, look at the people that I am with. And mm. these politicians, they'll even question my both integrity and my thinking capacity. That's right. So number one. Yeah. Then on the other side, I said, look, I can't show you a video. I can't show you a video. So when I go back to the hotel, it will be a fight. Who mm. was there? Why didn't I see a video? And when you come back home, it is a fight, which started from Cape Town. Mm. Then it continues when I'm home. Mm. You understand? And they to a certain extent, you, especially myself, then I started calling her, you are insecure. You're... Now, you see, sometimes you forget about the seed that you have actually right. sown in. Right. So now that, that becomes a problem because even if you are to meet innocent women with no intentions of anything whatsoever, she's suspicious. Yeah. Who is that one? Who was you talking to over the phone? You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the, the, this is why this is what most people who saw a seed of cheating forget because especially as men I'm not only 
talking as a pastor because I don't, I don't want to talk about a yes, pastor yes. as a pastor. You're talking as a leader. Uh, as a leader. So per, this conversation perhaps. is about Absolutely. it's a leadership conversation. You, you know, the biggest mistake that we make is uh, where, especially male figures, we mm. feel like uh, I said I'm sorry and uh, everything must just go back to normal. Go back to normal. And in many cases, it doesn't work like that with our female counterparts. Right, totally. So, so, so that also became one of the seeds of, 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 of rather seeds that actually compromised the foundation of what we believed in, you know. But by the way, you know, when I met uh, my wife, you know, we were both naive. Mm -hmm. We loved Jesus. Yeah. We prayed a lot at times, Christmas times, we had no food, no enough food, bought brown bread, put poloni between it. Mm. We had a good Christmas day and we thanked God. Now, when resources started coming in, they kind of destabilized. I see. You know, you know maybe let, let, me, let me make this uh, a point. Uh, and this is not to attack anybody. Yeah. You see, the African church is so obsessed in uh, teaching its members on breakthroughs. One day you'll be a millionaire. But no pastor prepares us enough. What happens to when you you're when you're a millionaire? You know, what happens to you when you are successful? Mm. What happens to you when uh, money works for you and you no longer work for money? Mm. There's no church in my books on record which has that track record to say, we have raised 10 millionaires mm. in the past five years and there's no uh, baggage whereby those millionaires that have been raised uh, are, are, are divorcing or what. All of us, we, we grow up poor. We right. get married poor. Yeah. And we follow this Jesus poor. And the moment things changes, then you start hearing about us in the newspapers. Mm. That's so true. Finally, before we end this first part of this interview, we're going to go into the second part. Uh, how did the brokenness of divorce affect your children, your beautiful children, three of them, isn't it? Yes. And where are they now? I know over the years, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, they have to understand that and grow. And mm -hmm. you had a good relationship with them. Yes. Now tell us just about your relationship with them and how you're trying to make sure they, they are okay. To be honest with you, men of God, uh, to start with, l let me start from here before I speak about my children. Mm. You know, uh, uh, I've been in a theological seminary and uh, there's something that I see missing, uh, especially when it comes to African indigenous theological colleges. We teach so much about officiating marriages. We teach so much about officiating weddings. Mm. We don't teach so much about managing and handling divorce. And uh, yes, when I went through it, which I have taken responsibility that yeah. I'm the cause, though I was the recipient of the divorce papers. Mm. I, I want to make this disclaimer so that yes. our, 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 our viewers can It wasn't follow. an option for you. Yes. In spite of the brokenness. Absolutely. You would never demand for it not at all yeah not at all so when so uh, so so be, besides that men, men, men of god i got bruised and i went straight into alcohol you know because it gave me sanity mm. it gave me some kind of uh, of uh, a good escape from thinking about what was going on especially in those days i remember even you calling me to say mm -hmm. Piri, I've seen something in the paper. What is happening? Mm -hmm. You know, after speaking to you, the best friend at that time was alcohol, and the, and the, which is not a solution. And by the way, I have been building myself to become an ambassador and to become an advocate of how you can avoid using uh, substances such as alcohol and drugs and other things in order to to in order to escape from from problems from so, your pain so, from, from my pain depression my brother i became a mess to an extent whereby i didn't know whether it was a monday or a sunday wow and now you can imagine what's happening in the lives of my children mm -hmm. my you know like i was i've been a this person that has been so much close to my kids, you know, like i will have uh, conversations with my kids like every weekend i would have a meeting with them 
which I would call Desa, which I would call our own Codesa, mm. where everyone must accept and testify of what happened during the week and what they went through during the week, challenges they faced during the week, and how can we help? So we spoke about it. Like now, suddenly, after being with these kids that have brought into this world for all these years, you no longer do that. Mm. So my life became a mess. Thank God, thank God, just thank God that um, uh, God kept them. Mm. God kept them and the, there's no there is no uh credit that I can get from from anybody. God kept my children because you see the church at that time they were judging them a lot. They were persecuting them a lot yeah. until they even uh, decided to join another church which they go to and they save in the church which is a uh, winners chapel in the south. Yeah. They they, they save there and they are they are happy. And uh, even where I am today, Restoration House in Midrand, they don't even come there. So mm. they asked me the other day, Daddy, do you want us to come to the church where you are? I said, mm. guys, I think you're safer yeah. to be where you are. <laughs> you're, you're older enough to take absolutely, responsibility absolutely. for your faith. Yeah, but in short, men of God, it was a mess. It was a mess. I can never define, I would describe this mess because most parents, when they divorce, they don't think about the children. You know, mm. children are an afterthought. But I can tell you that that's where monsters are built. Yeah. That's where monsters are built and are, are groomed. And, the, and the, it was a mess. That's all I can say. Because literally, I suspended my parenthood. I remember I used to cry a lot. I cried a lot. And, yeah. and, and, and my son came to me and said to me, Daddy, you know, you, 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 you I, 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 I grew up looking at you as my hero. Why do you cry? I grew up, I viewed you as my, 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 my father, a man that I can go and cry to. Why are you crying? You are mm. breaking me. Mm. You know, you know, when my son said those words, my last born boy, I just said, you know what, Lord, I don't know. Even if I want to fix, where do I start? You know, because you must understand when he, you are in that space, uh, there's so much expectant of you by the community, number one. Mm. The community is expecting you to still be a man of mm. God. And where do you start? And you call some pastors and they, 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 they are afraid of coming to you because they don't want to be associated. Right. Yet, there's so many great men of God that God sent to spoke into my life. Mm. You know, I can't mention all of them. And uh, the likes of Bishop Benjamin Dube, uh, Bishop Shabalala, uh, David Mulapo, Bishop Musasoro drove to my house. You know, there's a number of them that came to me, but of course you must understand they've got their own schedules, yes. their own programs. David Mulapo, many pastors that came to me to see me, Piri, what's happening? But also at the same time, you know, you have to make a decision to say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of living this kind of life. Mm. But where do you start? Mm. <laughs> you know, because you are talking about a broken marriage here. Yeah? On the other side, you're talking about a broken ministry. Mm. On the other side, you're talking about your br broken yourself. So yeah. when I want to fix things, I mean, what when must come start. first? Yeah. So fine, let me put myself first. Now, when you put yourself first, you, you also find yourself in situations whereby at this moment, you need somebody to hold your hand mm. and say, let's ride on. Let's come together. And this is where I discovered that uh, most of us in ministry, are just there for social media to to shine. Yeah. You know, somebody will come and say, hey, Mfundisi, Benzo Tata is tombe now. Hey, Mara. You know, I, I, I don't want to take a picture with you now. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think. It's, oh, by the way, to think what? Wow. He got to that stage? Yes, it went to that stage where people literally would not want to associate themselves mm. with me. It got to that point. And mm. I understood. And I understand. And, and to be honest with you, uh, Uncle Solomon, if I wasn't in business, in, now you must remember, in business, I met nanny believers. Mm. These are people who say, Piri, are you stressed? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's go to a pub and have one or two. When you come back home, you'll be fine. So partners in, in, in business made more sense than partners in ministry. Mm. A partner in ministry won't even invite you to a, to a Bible study. I remember, ne, this is, it sounds like a joke, but it happened. Uh, in that confusion, I had a long-standing invitation to minister in, uh, in London, in the UK. Mm. I landed at Heathrow, 
waiting for the man of God to fetch me at Heathrow, obviously he heard through social media, through newspapers about my divorce. His wife gave him an ultimatum that if you bring Piri to the church, you and me are done. Got to that? Yes, because I don't want Piri here or else Piri will bring the spirit of divorce in my house. And the pastor ghosted me. So you were stranded at Heathrow. I was stranded at Heathrow. Whom do you phone? Whom do you call? And it and suddenly, when I was at the airport, through TBN programs, mm. another lady spotted me to say, "I've seen you on TV," <laughs> and you know, I think I looked like a mess. <laughs> I said, "Oh, you've seen me on TV. Why, why are you here? Are you now, in trouble? Is there are any you help? in trouble?" Then I said, "You know, I came to miss to one church, and they can't answer my calls. W which number?" I said, "No, I, I can't even find." The now this woman realized that. Look, I'm, I'm really, I don't know what am I saying. Mm. She said to me. Pastor, let's go. I will take you to my pastor. She comes from a Jamaican community okay. in the in the in the northern part of the UK. Yeah. Then she took me, went there, dressed up. And luckily, the pastor knows me through TBN. Mm. So I was invited. I spoke. But in between services, I was running away for some drink. <laughs> you know, because you see, you see, that is what they call. There's what we call uh, 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 um, um, uh, withdrawals. You know, alcohol is like is a drug. Yeah. When you drink, it's poison. It's poison. When mm. when you drink, tomorrow you are at your lowest of the lowest. So in order for you to sustain yourself, you need to take drink another again. one. So you think you're getting rid of your stress? You're you are not. actually not getting rid of your stress. You actually make yourself twice fit for hell. Then I, until I came back to South Africa, to my reality, then uh, yes, there are men of God out there who look at you. you. You know, men of God, if you can check the record of our church, there's no musician we never brought to our church. Mm. And there's no great local men of God we never brought to our church. Yes. And they all disappeared. Stranded and alone. That's the life of uh, Pastor Enoch Piri, Restoration House. We... <laughs> We've had that side of it, you know, family, divorce, ministry. But we're going to take a break and we're going to go into the second part. When we come back in the second part, there's still a bit of mess. Because in his quest to find love, he fell into the hands of Jezebel. Join me in the second part.